Harry is taken into this magical world and he just sees this place as being amazing. And I like the fact that Harry has a moment in every film, just remembering how cool magic actually is. I love magic. Harry's magical world, it's a dangerous place. The magic is very real. It can hurt you as well as charm you. We have to be sensing the magical all the time. You just accept that there's a universe in which this kind of stuff happens. There's a lot of magic in the Potter films. We're bringing to life that magic. It's just amazing what they can do. Seeing all that stuff come to life. You can go time lapses, you can bring things to life. You can make people who are dead come back. Or make things levitate. Wingardium Leviosa. Or sneak around under a sheet that makes you invisible. Magic is an infinite possibility. Harry, your eyesight really is awful. Every Potter film introduces a new challenge where you're sort of breaking new territory and you're doing things that haven't been done before. And we'll spend minutes, hours, days just looking at these effects and scrutinising them and talking about character, story. Do we believe them? How do we make that better? Can you build this thing? Will the laws of physics defeat you? Can you get it into the set? Just working on it, I get excited, being like, oh my god, I can't wait to see what this looks like. <laughs> It really is a case of so many different partners all coming together to create the most magical effect. One of the great things about the Potter films is we have all these different departments under one roof at Leavesden here. It's always a, a multi-department task to realise one of these films. So much of, of what we're doing, particularly on Potters, all interacts. A lot of the stuff in the practical department is doing the foreground. The visual effects are doing the background and, and putting the two together. John will design a rig and then we'll plonk our actors onto the rig, shoot the actors and then we'll extract that back and put it back into our animation we'll use the creature effects department to then build us a back for a creature which may be animated, it may not, may be an animatronic. You know, it's like being in a street somewhere where you're going around to get the sugar or borrow the milk. It's a very, very pleasant working environment because there's always someone who knows how to do something you don't know. All right, so let's hand the set over to specials, please. So there's always somebody to ask for help, and you're always offering help, you know, to someone who comes to you for your skills. Well, if you, could, if you could wedge the milkiness as well a little bit, that'd be good. Yeah. I think okay. Because even now, now we're seeing different things. When you direct visual effects, you go in and you just hear this tap, 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 tap of computer keyboards. And it's a bit like a chicken coop. It's kind of like, it's quite dark. Everyone's glued to these screens and, and they're working so hard and diligently. So it's very kind of, it's high tech, but very quiet and intense. Tim Burke is my visual effects director. He's into story, he's into character, and visual effects are a tool to express those things. To me, visual effects are just one more tool at the disposal of the director to create something that you can't achieve in camera, or to build a set that you can't build, or populate a city that you can't populate, for whatever reason it is. At the time, Turner is a shot which would basically be impossible to achieve otherwise where you see the two children reverse time, where you actually have a moment where the whole of the environment they're in, including the, the lighting, changes. It goes from night time, the moon goes down, it goes to sort of late evening with the sun coming up. What just happened? All the events that happened in the past three hours happen in reverse, yet at the same time the two kids are actually acting in sort of, if, we, if you like, forward time. Hermione. We then follow them on a journey after the time has been taken back to earlier in the evening. And 
we actually carry the journey on with them out of the set and into the environment outside. There's no way you could even conceive doing that practically. Practical effects is as important as the visual effects department because there are many things on a day-to-day -day basis that we do with smoke and wind and people flying. It's not all done with visual effects. Ready, and one, and two, and three, and four. I do the practical effects on the, on the Potter films. That involves anything that you see practically happen on film, on the screen. There are so many magical things that you can do. For instance, when dragons breathe fire, we do the fire. We had radio control chess pieces that were 12 feet high. When the, the Black Lake turns into ice, we put a, a freezer unit into the tank and froze the set so we had six inches of solid ice all over the set. This is the door from the Chamber of Secrets. It was built from scratch. We have a, a snake which comes out of the back of the door here from the hinge area and it actually travels all the way around the outside of the door. And as it does so, all of these snakes, which are supposed to be the locks for the door, they all retract. I'm forever trying to talk people into doing it for real. The letters in Privet Drive, I can remember having a conversation with Chris. I said, oh, well, you know, we can do that and fill the room with letters. And he looked at me as I was slightly loopy. Oh, no. So I thought that'd be CGI, and I said, no, you know, we can, we can do it. We build all these devices that would throw envelopes out at a very rapid but controlled speed and built them into the top of the set all the way around. And I remember seeing the first, when he showed me the first test, David and I looked at each other like, wow, he actually did it. John actually pulled this off. There's not a visual effect in that sequence. Those are all real letters flying around the room. But it gave you a real sense of, of practical magic. So the magic comes from all sides, visual effects, physical effects. What really makes it magical is when all those skills come together to create a piece of, uh, of amazing magic. The battle between Dumbledore and Voldemort in the atrium. That really brought both disciplines of visual effects and um, special effects together. Because there's a lot of practical effects to make that environment alive. And then there's a lot of visual effects on top of that to extend the environment and add things that couldn't be done practically. For instance, generating the fire serpent. We've used a lot of interactive light on the set. We've used red light on Harry here so that you can really feel that heat from the fire serpent is actually hitting him. And then we've used a combination of practical fire and CG fire to create the serpent. We created a moving, spinning, splashing six-foot ball of water for the visual effects department to use as elements to build up the ball of water that Voldemort is trapped inside. To shoot the scenes of Voldemort trapped in the water, one of the things they did was set up a rig for Ray Fiennes to sit on up on the top of a large pole with a little seat, like a tractor seat with belts holding me in so I could lean back, lean forward, you know, and not be, and feel safe. And David wanted to see the effects of the spells that they were casting back and forth, damaging the atrium. So we built rigs in to blow out large sections of the set. And we wanted to blow them up with, with the actors in the set or with stunt people in the set. So you can see all of these practical explosions showering around Dan with the slates coming off, and he's really sitting in the middle of that, so he's reacting to every single explosion. It's real, and we're connecting the visual effects side of it to those explosions so that you think, wow, that's all coming from this big spell. Then the final culmination, the use of real sand as the glass turns to sand, being blasted onto Michael Gambon, who didn't appreciate it, but it looks real because it is real. So a combination of 
using visual and special effects to really tell a very exciting story. films about magic try and break the rules of physics and the rules of, of science and, and Harry Potter bends the universe I think a little bit more subtly than most films do. It's kind of hinged on certain principles and I think that helps to suspend the audience's disbelief. It makes it feel plausible in some way. Ordinary wizarding level examinations. Oh. Else. I think it's the practicality of it. It's the fact that it's every day and you just need to learn how to do these things and that's obvious and clear and let's get on with this. It's like learning how to do the housework, which I think is tremendously interesting and, and very funny. Turn to page 394. You know, that everyone's going, oh, my wand's gone. And then they might as well be talking about a cooker or a washing machine. So there is a need to temper the magic with reality. And in fact, reality is often our starting point for creating the visual effects. Everything we build is fake. So if you can create a false reality that people buy into in your work, it works. Because even though it's magical, it still has to have real physicality and gravity has to affect things, things have to move in a certain way. One of the really difficult things, and it happens a few times in the book, is when big chunks of masonry move. But if it is conceivable at all, then how would those bricks move? I'm thinking of that hole in the wall in, into Diagon Alley particularly. We did literally follow the the progress of each brick as it moved both sideways and, and backwards, not just in two dimensions, but in three dimensions. And there was a, a logic to it. In the vein of trying to keep things real, I, I try and look for inspiration from the organic world, the real world, wherever I can. I spend a lot of time looking at jellyfish and the, the amazing structures within a jellyfish. They emit a light, the translucency and transparency. If you can look at that and interpret that into a, a wand effect or something like that. For something like the stinging jinx, which is basically a disfiguring, swollen effect on the face, we looked at reference of all sorts of diseases like mumps, different things like that. And the ability to photograph that real thing is priceless. As far as building the firework sequence, John Richardson and the special effects team gave us a whole bunch of early fireworks reference. John said if he pretty much cleaned out his closet of whatever old fireworks he had, he would light the fuse and couldn't say what would happen other than as long as he stand about 20 feet back, it should be fine. And so we just rolled cameras on everything he could throw at us. So from those reference shoots, we built up an understanding of the little intricacies of real fireworks and pyrotechnics and the way they smoke and the way they flash. It's all about attention to detail. They are things that the audience hopefully will recognize from their own experience in the real world. Because then that allows the audience to become emotionally invested in what they're actually looking at. onto the platform, <laughs> not to worry. Now, all you've got to do is walk straight at the wall between platforms nine and 10. It's best do it at a bit of a run if you're nervous. And remember, Dan, keep your head up set in Hogwarts is a huge castle which is surrounded by a black lake filled with squids, giant squids and lots of other deadly things. There are thousands of staircase portraits that speak to you. Amazing! Loads of passageways intertwined. 
It's just like a really magical place. The whole castle's about magic, so that if you're talking about a sequence in the girls' bathroom and Moaning Myrtle's there, well, it wasn't just that it was gonna be Moaning Myrtle, the ghost. It's that the stained glass window was gonna be moving as well. We're always looking for those opportunities. I mean, we're oftentimes presented with how do we create or bring the magic even before we get to Hogwarts. Welcome home. Each of the films has sort of done it in their own way. On the first film, when we were in the boats on the Black Lake, we literally sat in these boats. Underneath, we had the cables going under the lake, and it was actually a little little sort of reservoir built in the studio. And as far as we were concerned, certainly just sitting on these boats and just drifting across the river effortlessly, which was fantastic. And the third one, the carriage is being pulled by the invisible uh, horses. There's just so much of that kind of stuff, and you want to explore it. As somebody who's watching the films, you want to explore that place. We built a moving staircase in the first one that had the actors walking up it as it was swinging round. It had to be seen to close off one walkway as it moved into another, and the banister rails had to all move. For us, it was a relatively simple mechanical rig, but when it all goes together, it does start to look like the magical world it is, I suppose. It isn't done in special effects. The stairs are on sort of wheel system, so you do actually literally move. What happened though? Well, it hasn't quite clicked in, had it? Isn't it? No, we jumped over heroically. I remember being quite taken aback when it suddenly started to move, but I guess you weirdly get used to it. Heroic deeds come naturally <laughs> to me. <laughs> Harry, are you sure? I saw it. It's just like with Mr. Weasley. It's the same door I've been dreaming about for months, only I couldn't remember where I'd seen it before. Guys, you can relax a second. After you, Emma. I can't relax until you're relaxing. No, please. <laughs> oh, all right, OK. <laughs> so. The moving portraits at Hogwarts is, I think, a really well-established, charming piece of magic. <laughs> Someone's job in the art department to come up with uh, the concepts for each of the portraits and then the person will get cast, or the people will get cast, or sometimes members of the crew. I think there's David Heyman and the producers in one portrait. It's a reasonably simple effect. We shoot a background element, which is a flat painted element, practically painted, and we shoot that like a background plate. Then we shoot the character against a blue screen, composite them together, and then we add a portrait texture you get that sort of reflection and crackling that you get on old oil paintings. We could not have just one or two portraits moving. No, wait! Everything had to be moving. And that was kind of complicated because you have to do each portrait separately. And then you have to plan the choreographies of how you go when you move characters from one to the next. We are developing some new portrait moments for Harry Potter 7. I think that's charming really, that you can have these things that are just still there. And there's something, I think, reassuring about that. That's the thing about Hogwarts magic, is that it's a continuity. It's an accumulation of magic. It's not real, the ceiling. It's just bewitched to look like the night sky. I read about it in Hogwarts a history. We would do certain effects on a film, and maybe on the next film, we would change them up a little bit. The candles in the Great Hall, we changed the pattern of the candles and we added dripping wax, just something to make it a little bit more textural. The running joke for, for us on, on Potter was that that castle changed every movie. It had to do one thing for one movie and, or something was added for the next movie. So we've, we've done our best through all the movies to sort of not keep you in this one little space of the castle.
Well, the beauty of Harry Potter is that there's this whole universe that you're able to create. J.K. Rowling's books and all of these films have these beautiful, fantastic and hugely creative visions that, that you conjure up when you, when you read the books and when you watch the films. Salvio Hexia. But the beauty of Harry Potter is that we get to actually make that. I mean, there's so many bits and pieces that we do in the creation of environments. We shoot various scenes actually here at Leavesden Studios on the back lot. We use blue screens and green screens. We use bits of set, and then we use a lot of plates of Scotland or other locations like the boroughs, and we use that to put that in to create the world as if the actors were in Scotland. You will have a space that is, that is surrounded by green. That space is the size of a football pitch, and the stuff that's put on afterwards is wrapped around you. When you see Harry walking through the Scottish hillside in the snow, it's one single shot with a lot of different layers, so it was very complex. We had to build the snow, we had to create all the environments and piece them together. Piece that miniature model with that blue screen element and blend it seamlessly so you actually believe that it exists. The Quidditch World Cup is a classic example of elaborating, expanding on, uh, on a set. We you know we could build only so many tiers of the, of the stands, and yet this thing had to be bigger than, than any stadium around, you know? And it, well, even the tent city that, that leads up to it, you know, that, that was all just backlot. Welcome to the Quidditch World Cup. The set extensions are a huge part of our work. I think you get outside more, you get to see bigger vistas, and I think that opens it out for the filmmakers. And, you know, Harry Potter is a big world, and so you want the environments to reflect that. Guys, step up, mate. Don't be shy. Three hands. One lady. All go down. Let the floor come up. Don't be so mean. Go on, Anything, first, first, ten to one. In the underwater sequence, we had to create for that not only an underwater environment, but it had to be a magical underwater environment. We began first with the thought that we might do it what's called dry for wet, where you take an actor, you blow wind on them to give the sense of movement. The problem with that for us was that the hair would never move in, and undulate at the right speed. It never really felt like you were going to believe that you were underwater. So it then became clear to us that we were going to have to shoot this underwater in some form or other. And we had to build a tank. We dug out the huge pit in D stage, which was designed by John and completely sort of fitted out under his supervision. We all thought he was a bit mad, actually, it was a far too big a hole. When we started, it was just enormous. I thought we were digging the whole studio up. It was just... <laughs> but he was right. Actually, in the end, it was the perfect size. The blue screen underwater tank was used, essentially, to um, allow us to key Dan off the background. We used backlit blue screen material in this instance where we basically created a three-walled tank with a viewing window at one side so that there were no lights in any of the shots and the screen itself was perfectly evenly lit from behind, which helps us massively in the actual keying and getting a decent mat and good edges. Again, it's all part of the technical side of then putting him into the other world. The sequence itself, you know, offered lots of different challenges. There were so many different aspects of the sequence. It was weeks and weeks of shooting. Go for it, or rehearse one. Go for it, it's not mine. We had to train Dan Radcliffe to swim underwater, and Dan had to perform while holding his breath, effectively. Three to out. The bubble's clear, and action. So he would perform for 10 seconds, 15 seconds. And looking down there. And air it, air it. And then one of the divers would swim over with the oxygen, he'd breathe, and then he would do the next take. Streaming. Very good, Dan. Well done. The main thing that really sort of was a bit frustrating was the fact that communication is obviously quite difficult. There are certain signals like this. This confused me, because this means, quick, I'm drowning, get me up to the surface. Whereas to me, that means, hey, I'm fine. It does take a while to get used to it. We built an underwater habitat so that the actors didn't have to come up 
to the surface in between takes. Right, just take a 15 minute break for the minute, drink some water. Okay, can we stay down here, yeah? Stay down there for a the minute. They had a loudspeaker and camera system to, to give them contact with the surface so they could talk to the director and get instructions for the next shot. And zap! So it was hugely challenging from a physical and practical standpoint. Dan, thank you very much for a good week. Let's stand out the water, please. Print that one as well. Thank you very much, Dan. And then, with the aid of digital effects, we had to create the environment and create the creatures. It's virtually completely computer generated, apart from Harry himself. The scale of things had to be beyond what was real. There was very complicated rocks and cliffs. The water was filled with particulate floating around. Everything was covered in lots of different types of seaweed, all of which was moving in every single shot. We had to make it feel underwater. We had to make it feel murky and dank and deep. But at the same time, sometimes we needed to be able to see hundreds of metres into the distance to get some beautiful wide landscapes. At one stage, we changed the look of everything completely and started again from scratch because it looked fantastic at that stage, but it didn't look scary enough. So the whole sequence took about 18 months, right from the first imaginings of, of how, how to make it work to, to the final delivery of the last shot. So it was a lot of fabrication, a lot of imagination while shooting it. A real challenge, but an awful lot of fun. Shooting and action. Mind your head. <laughs> hey guys, guys, why the long faces? Why the long faces? <laughs> if we are something yeah. like like this. I think there's great scope for creativity on Harry Potter. And action! And if it's the right thing to do, and even though it's technically challenging, then we'll try and do it. I'm playing a character called Aunt Marge. She blows up like a balloon and floats away. And it's a lot easier to say that than it is to do it. The biggest makeup effects thing we had on Azkaban was Aunt Marge. Or Pam Ferris. She went through inflating suits of different sizes. She's in a prosthetic makeup where we just inflated around her neck. Then she's in a bodysuit where you're actually inflating everywhere. The blowing up happens with what they call bladders. <laughs> and at my biggest, I'm about four, four foot six across. <laughs> the whole process of getting into that takes about five hours. I have a leaning post that I can lean on when I'm when the weight of the costume, which is about 50 pounds on your shoulders, is heavy. It's a strange business, is all I can say. One of the weirdest, weirdest things I've ever done in my life. It was hysterically funny, and all done practically. We shot it in about a week and a half, I think, but it was months of preparation. Generally, when we come to shoot Potter films, the more we've talked about it, the more we've pre-planned, the more effective we are at being able to film it correctly take something like Quidditch and if you haven't figured that out before you get on stage and you start rolling the cameras then you're, you're in trouble. The process starts when we pre his storyboards. Once the director has designed the sequence with the storyboard artist, we take those storyboards and we do a 3D animatic interpretation of the storyboards which is we call a pre-visualization. There's an awful lot of information that you need to go onto the set armed with, and we find using this technique of producing an animation in advance informs everybody from the director to the cameraman to the actors themselves. It's just um, a very good tool for um, exploring the space before, uh, before we actually go and shoot it. You can see the snake and Harry coming out of the wall. Here you can see all the controls for animating the snake. You can just take her and animate her around. We animate the camera like, uh, like any other camera you would do, different lenses. And we ended shooting some of these in the, in the real set. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, that would be right. My camera. Up. You need a bit more. Right. I just need to get a plate without the fallen toys in and set up for the first show in the morning. And when you when you lean in, try and bring your hand as close to that as possible. Right. So it goes in. Yeah, Fabi. Right. <laughs> but we don't adhere strictly to the previews. We'll adapt and work when we're actually in the filming stage. Yes. Can you go faster than that? Yeah. It's magic. It's magic. You've got to be flexible, you've got to be able to change, you've got to be able to move with it. All we do is we shoot it like this and then we'll completely change it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the time, we will have done all that planning and we'll get to set and something really exciting will happen with the actors or the walkthrough. I Actually, I'm just late. There we are. That, that's brilliant. And we think it'll probably be visual effects me. We'll take the what? wires and everything away. Oh, but it was really. I'm so interested shot. to see how the um, all these bag tricks come out. And we'll just go off at a completely different tangent, and we'll all be going, OK, <laughs> let's run to catch up. And that's fine. Head that way, Sambi. I've just been told to head this way. Oh, did you? Is that right? A more interesting. Oh, brilliant. It's turning the, everything upside down. <laughs> perfect. Good plan. Well, we may do. Fine. Yeah, good idea. OK, go for it. Yeah, let's All see. Right. Oh. There's something in there that might be a good idea and you want to be able to explore it. So there's always that room to experiment and, and change things around a little bit. It's about finding solutions. OK, here we go. And action. We were here on Friday night shooting Harry on patrol, taking watch by a fire, and he then sees a, a doe Patronus coming through the woods towards us. Because Patronus shines with its own light, uh, in order to get moving light on the foliage and the trees around. Animals provided us with a dog, and we then made a suit out of LEDs and batteries that went on its back, which could cast light in all directions around it, so it moved in its own pool of light. We call this Glow Beast. Let's take Glow Beast out and, uh, and his mark. We'll do that again, please. It looks silly when you, <laughs> when you shoot it, and there's... There's tons of that stuff where you might look silly in the process, but it, it gets the job done. And in fact, when we sit in, in meetings and we go round and round and round in circles and talk about something, eventually we might work our way back to the book because you just go, well, what, what was in the book? Oh, that was, actually, that's a really good idea. <laughs> Why don't we just do that? Messers, Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot and Prongs, Purveyors of aids to magical mischief makers are proud to present the, the Marauders, Marauders map. We always try and follow the description in the book. I solemnly swear that I am up to no good. Where there is description, we will take it. And there's always plenty of room to then build on it. When we started to think about the Marauders map, that was from the idea that the four characters who had created this were mischievous but in a kind of creative way and that they wanted to just make things as complicated as possible and crazy as possible. So I decided to do that for myself and make it as complicated as possible. Physically, that was what I set myself up to do, was to try and have something that felt like you could unfold it at any point and there would always be another bit that you could discover. And then in terms of the actual design, there are no lines on it. It's all created with words. Mischief managed. We did have Paul Keeve, who's a magician, come and work out a rig. And so he came in and showed us how we could do all of these actual tricks on set, and one of which was with tiny, tiny threads that had to be pulled in a certain order in a certain way. Mischief managed. A Marauder's map that opened on its own. I always remember being really, really impressed by that. <sighs> Serious. But different parts of the books, as descriptive as they are, there are parts that just are a little bit more ambiguous. They're hard to, to imagine what they are. Did you or did you not put your name into the Goblet of Fire? No! Shh. As it's written, when Sirius appears in the fireplace, he's described as being made out of burning embers and coming alive, which is a fantastic image and one that quite a lot of people can probably just conjure up immediately. But we've spent an awful lot of time trying to make that image work. It's a lot harder than you think, because you need to actually see pronunciation of the words. We really wanted to see that it was Sirius's face and that it was Gary Oldman giving that performance. And we spent months and months experimenting with different ways of actually making that not look cartoony. What we really wanted to do was make realistic, photographic-looking embers talk. And we took this idea that by putting air on them, 
they glow and therefore we can use that to accentuate words and that it'll go hotter and colder depending on what he's saying. I haven't a clue of what your name in that goblet, Harry, but whoever did is no friend to you. People die in this tournament. It had this sort of plasticky, cartoony quality to it. On Order of the Phoenix, we wanted to improve it. It's a simpler effect. You can see Gary Oldman, you can see it's him and you can hear what he's saying and see him pronounce the words. What does he think? We're forming some sort of wizard army? Well, that's exactly what he thinks. That Dumbledore was assembling his own forces to take on the Ministry. And ultimately, it was probably more successful in the storytelling. Yes! <laughs> the magic is hugely important and really entertaining, but we've tried constantly... You said! You said! ...not to let the visual effects overshadow the story. They should be there to serve the story. Basically, the frame is... Filled with birds. Filled with birds. We have a lot of discussions with the director and with the editors and the producers in order to make sure that we're hitting certain beats of the story that they want to be told. The flight to Thames sequence, David was very keen to have a sort of protective formation design of the characters around Harry. And there's a little story of interaction between him and Tonks on the river. There were three beats. It was protection, enjoyment between Tonks and Harry, and then a little bit of a, a swerve, a little bit of a, a danger moment. The graveyard sequence in Goblet of Fire, it's a big visual effects sequence, but it's, it's typical of a lot of the visual effects sequences. That you're, if you're doing it right, you're doing it because it's a contribution to the story. It has its own story, a good fight. You know, someone seems to get the better of it, bang, bang, and then, and then suddenly someone recovers and lands a massive punch. <laughs> Harry's color would push on Voldemort's color, and then Voldemort would push back which person had the upper hand when the hot spot of the wand was getting closer to the other characters. So there's a change in the mood of the visual effects that reflects what's going on with the story. He's mine to finish! I think that's always first and foremost with the work on, on the Harry Potter films. He's mine! magic in Harry Potter, and what makes the magic intoxicating is that that magic is very grounded in real characters. Look at the Weasleys, and you look at their sense of mischief and fun, and that's most certainly expressed in their magic. Into the cauldron, handsome. And then Boggarts, you know, Boggarts, it's uh, the, uh, the, the physical expression of each individual's deepest fear. Ridiculous! So that is obviously a very personal thing. I think that clearly with Patroni, it, it's very much a reflection of, of, of character. Fantastic, Ginny! When you form a full Patronus, a fully formed Patronus, it takes a, a unique personal form of a creature. So again, it's this really personal connection that you have to your Patronus. And Harry's stag Patronus is always a very proud animal. There's something regal about it. Hermione had an otter. And that was a beautiful thing because we, we played on the idea that when they play, they, they sort of they roll in water and they swim around. Ron creates a, a Labrador. And that Labrador is a sort of slightly goofy, clumsy puppy, but very loyal. And those are all the characteristics that we know that Ron has. Luna's hair, for instance, I mean, the, the creature, the hair, was a lovely little thing to animate because it really had to embody her soul and slight quirkiness. There was quite a big discussion about what the Patronus would be because David Yates was kind of thinking, wouldn't it be nice if her Patronus flew like a, a bird or a butterfly or something? But she's not all that airy-fairy. She has that real deep side to her as well. And J.K. Rowling said, it's a hair. <laughs> <laughs> It's quite a challenging thing because you want to try and make the hair's movement look as naturalistic as possible, but at the same time it's doing something which is quite unnatural, you know, it's, it's running through the air, it's flying all around this room, it's defying gravity. And the idea is that the Patronus light becomes the creatures, the creatures become the Patronus light. We create many different layers of effects for this. There are big, flat, wide sheets of light, very thin ropes and braids of very energetic light. 
The hair itself gets uh, several different layers of transparency and shine and glow. We uh, add a little bit of what we call interactive light, so as the hair bounces off the walls, the walls glow a little bit. We also have to create reflections, because there's a lot of reflective surfaces in there. There's mirrors and there's windows. So you can see here what was actually shot on set. She's uh, flicking her wand to create the Patronus. When I was doing the Patronus with Emma, I was like, expect a Patronum. And a thing didn't come out of my wand, you know? And I was a bit disappointed, and I had to imagine it was there. It's a very kind of unsatisfying thing when you're kind of on set, when you're kind of waving a wand, and literally you're just waving a stick in the air. It was almost like how I assume children play in the playground, how they're like shooting spells, but obviously nothing's happening until it goes on uh, later on. But the whole thing just seemed like a load of adults like playing in the playground type thing with these spells. I was laughing the other day because doing a scene, I was blocking all these spells from Voldemort, and I was doing all this and sort of jumping around like that. And then I just, and then I saw it on the monitor playing. It was like I was doing some weird dance or something. It was, it was just, it was so odd. Like Roop and Dan, you're in the frame here. You guys have to be looking, eyes wide, scared, doing this a couple of times. If you do this, I can, I can put a CG pixie in. So if you do that, and as you get down, lift the books like that, looking over the books. And Emma, you, Roop, you're doing the same thing, like looking around at them. Really put yourself into that moment, because what you guys ended up doing last time is you're kind of laughing a little bit. And it's not as, it's got to be real. It's got to be scary. And that goes, for, that goes for all of you guys. If you guys really get into the scene and really start to duck and really pretend that you're seeing these things coming at you, it, it helps, OK? No! 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 Of course, with all the incredible effects that go on, you don't have any of it as an actor around you. You know that a phoenix is descending or, or rising or the whole thing is exploding all around you and you try and live that. So you have to really know your cues, really be able to pinpoint where everything is meant to be at the right time. The Hall of Prophecies is a good example. The entire thing is a digital set. Of course, on the shelves there are millions of these glass orbs. When we looked at the designs, the first thing that sprung to me was, well, you can't build anything that big, and you'll only be able to build a partial amount, and then we'll have to extend it anyway. And everything's glass, so it's going to reflect anything, so we'll probably spend more time painting things out than putting things in. It just seemed like, really, this was the set that lent itself perfectly to using computer graphics. We basically shot um, all of the actors on green screen so that we could put the digital set in around them. I have to tell you, for the actors, it's hard because green screen is not the easiest thing to key off if you're trying to find a performance. That was actually, I remember it being quite daunting. I think when we all stepped on, we were literally kind of, is this all we have? We almost can't imagine that because a room like that doesn't exist. So you need to find ways of stimulating all the actors and making them feel it's real. So I got my sound designer, James, to create a soundtrack which created an ambience and a kind of spooky feel. Never long bottom, is it? How's mum and dad? Better now they're about to be avenged. <laughs> and I, I'd play that to everybody before we'd shoot something sometimes. I'd say, listen, guys, I just want you to close your eyes, and this is what this environment sounds like. And we'd press the button, and this strange, spooky sound would come on. Have you got that? OK, we've all got that. Good, OK, hold that thought. OK, turn over. Now! After a day of shooting, I suddenly realised I was probably with the greatest green screen pros in the universe. When you say, I want you to imagine this whole shelf is collapsing, you know, most seasoned professional actors would struggle with that. But actually, you know, they've been doing green screen for like 10 years. The action is that the spider on the end of the spell that Moody is putting out, lands first down on Alfie's book. It then takes off and goes to Goyle's head. What often we do is we'll have maybe a fishing rod with uh, a little tennis ball or a piece of paper hanging on the end of it. And we do rehearsals where we may bring in some kind of object or a stand-in that we can move around. 
that uh, the kids can actually see. But a lot of it really just comes down to imagination. This is not going to be the final one, you know? <laughs> That's, what That's what acting's all about, really. It's about committing yourself to a reality. People say, you know, visual effects movies, you know, it's all about the visual effects. It isn't. It's about the acting, because the acting makes the visual effects ultimately work. You definitely need the performance of the actor. And on a Potter film, a lot of the shots do build off of the movements of the actors. Merlin's beard! We started thinking about Slughorn, and we thought about how it's written in the book, and most of it is down to the character. Having Jim Broadbent play the character, it's such a fantastic actor, just talked it through with David and realised all we really needed to do is get Jim to play an armchair. And <laughs> we'd just base everything from that. So uh, we created a, a seating rig that would allow him to sit and have his arms spread at the correct dimensions of uh, the armchair we wanted to make. And then at the correct moment in the shot, we lifted him up so he was raised up and he basically shook himself out. And then we drove all of the animation from that, basically, and then recreated the armchair and used his performances as the key motivation for what happened. You don't need to disfigure me, Elvis. Well, I must say, you make a very convincing armchair, Horace. Right, here we go, shooting! And also things like the apparating, for example. <laughs> what we realised through actually doing the effect, and it was a bit of trial and error, was that you needed the actor at the point of leaving, becoming smoke, and reappearing as smoke. And you needed some dynamic movement. Because that's the thing about apparating. They're there, and then suddenly they're over there. Eleanor Bonham Carter is a really good example of that. She's always gives this perfect performance where she stands up in a very melodramatic way, and her hair's flying all over the place, and her dress is flying everywhere, and she twirls around. And that's perfect for us because it actually gives some momentum to the effect. So it's always choreographing all this stuff. A lot of times it's a pretty physical effect, and you put them through some paces. They do it and luckily still have a smile on their face at the end of it all. Three, two, one, action! Diane and all the rest of the actors are great. They always have been, I mean, ever since they were very small. They're not particularly daunted by anything. If you say stand in front of that wall, it's gonna blow up in front of you. They say, oh, okay, fine. You know, it's very good when you work with guys in this special effects department. You know, there's there's nobody in there going to try and kill me or, you know, blow me up, so it was, I was quite calm about it. You know what you're going to do, and it's quite straightforward. But at the same time, there's just that moment of doubt of when they do go off, will I somehow, you know, I don't know, panic like a spooked horse or something and just do something weird. No. No. Dragon! Okay, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> We've got a lot of spell hits and things blowing up, a lot of wire rigs, which is always a bit of a challenge in and around the kids and the actors. So, guys, just uh, go over the cues again. We'll start the wind, then we'll give action, which will be for Mark to say, let go, kids. Let go! Then Kevin will give a count of three, two, one, go. Porky was a boot on top of a hill. So one, two, three, two goes on the boot, and <laughs> okay. And everybody lies down and, and they're in a ring around the boot. One, two, three, three. Main deal with the rig it was really just to be able to position all the kids in a safe way. So they had a massive studio and the kids are lying on a on a sort of semi-supported platform in a green screen. Basically, it was like a roundabout, a playground, and they just span us. It felt really quick, and they did it after lunch as well, so I we were feeling quite sick at the end. But yeah, it was it was quite cool. We all kind of fell from the sky on these like wires. Yeah, we did that ourselves. But on the set, they kind of padded the grass. Yeah, it was quite high up. It was quite fun. All that, all the wire stuff is really fun. 
The worst stuff was in the maze. We tried to make it taller than you've ever seen and bigger than you've ever seen. So you're in channels which are just five feet wide, but 25, sometimes 40 feet high. It's misty and it's altogether completely disorientating and it gets pretty intense and pretty desperate in there. It was quite claustrophobic, really. The cast and the crew started to come down with sort of maze fever at the end and just be like, we need to get out of here soon. We built a section of the maze that would actually move and the walls of the maze could close together and appear to crush you. It was all hydraulically operated, but it was controlled via a computer system. So we built a little model maze, and whatever we did with our model, the real one would do. You're running around actually fearing for your life <laughs> in, in reality. Basically, we were running through and pretending we were being hit by things, and then digitally, they sort of add in lots of vines and creepers hitting us in the face. We had bits where Cedric's on the ground. I was initially shot with just ropes tied to him, pulling him around. We did little bits and pieces of the root movement, but I think that mostly ended up with the visual effects boys. It was trying to get that fine dividing line between something that was animal and something that was plant. Even though it's not a human or a creature, you want to bring personality into it. In a way, it almost has to have a character. And I'd like to think that we can create a character that can then be directed by the director as an actor would. We have to take notes from the director. We have to embody them with personality. You have to believe they have a soul. Ronald Weasley! How dare you steal that car! I am absolutely disgusted! For the Howler letter, we needed to come up with a design that would work for both the closed version and the Howling version, which would be animated by visual effects. If you put another toe out of line, we'll bring you straight closed version is fairly straightforward, standard letter, but within it are elements that we knew that we could use for the shouting version. The ribbon round it is there for a reason, so that it can become a tongue that's, that's waggling as it's shouting. And the shape of the envelope lends itself to unfurling and becoming slightly mouth-like. And the letter inside, which does have the actual text of the scene, of Mrs. Weasley shouting, becomes the teeth. The ministry letter, which is based on the whole howler concept. Dear Mr. Potter. It's a tricky thing as well to give it a great sort of performance. The seal on the front of it turns into a pair of lips, and the little slit that goes down in the sides open up into a pair of eyes. You are hereby expelled from Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. And the idea is trying to add life to something that inherently is such an everyday sort of object. Another good example was the Quick Quotes Quill in uh, the fourth film. We could have done the simple thing of it just sits there on the pad and it starts moving and all that, but we just sort of extended Rita Skeeter into the quill itself. Scratch that last. The length of the quill, it adds to the feelings of the flourishes every time the pen does a little twirl, it ripples. There's points when Rita is no, slightly sure. flirtatious and it's slightly flirtatious too, and other times when it sits up and takes notice, and other times when it sneakily goes off and writes something down that it probably shouldn't have written down. And you can tell from the way it's been beautifully animated that it's got slightly sneaky intentions. It's a classic example of one of the things that makes the Harry Potter movies what they are, is this almost a throwaway little joke, a character. It's a side thing in the scene. But it's, you know, an extra level of humour and an extra level of interest. Just to give the movie the richness that it has. What is nice about the films is the special effects that are the small special effects. Delicate little moments that are just so beautifully done and some very comedic moments. In a way, we've gone along the same journey that Harry has gone on. So in the first films, 
Magic is stuff of awe. As Harry enters this world, it's a sense of wonder and amazement when we see anything magical. As we've gone on, I think we've sort of realised that people quite like seeing the magic and that we can do some really cool stuff with it. Professor. <coughs> and I think as we've gone on, we've got slightly bolder with what we can do and how far we think we can push the magic. There's loads of pressure to make the magic unique and wondrous. Fair warning, it tastes like goblin piss. We're always trying to do something different. When we were doing the Seven Harrys, it is a highly, highly technical scene using an incredibly complicated camera that I couldn't even hope to understand. And of course, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted with it because, you know, there's seven of me all at once on screen, so it's any actor's dream. And then come on, she pass it to Rupert. Yeah, the whole order kind of get together again. Mad Eye's plan, I think, is to create through the use of polyjuice potion, seven different Harrys. Fleur, Hermione, Ron, the Weasley twins, and Mundungus transform into me, which means that I had to give impersonations of all those other characters as me. This is you, just you as Dan at the beginning, guys. Um, and what it involves us in is a very complicated technical process of motion capture, both in terms of the performance of the actors that Dan will be mimicking but also in terms of allowing Dan to play each of those characters. So we used a system called MOVA, which is a facial capture system, um, which is fantastic because a lot of the capture systems up until now, you've had to put really big, sort of lumpy tracking dots on, onto faces or bodies or whatever you're tracking. But with MOVA, they actually coat the face with a reflective makeup. The actor then performs in the makeup and the computer is able to extrapolate the movement from this reflective makeup. This system gathers thousands and thousands of points of information, therefore the detail that you see from the capture session is as photographically real as the actor themselves. It's a breakthrough with your technology. We're going to capture different performances from each of those actors and then essentially do three-dimensional morphs between the two different animations. So we end up with a mixture of Dan Radcliffe and Emma Watson. So we, we make a hybrid character that becomes uh, a mixture of both of those personalities. Yeah. It's intriguing stuff, actually, and um, quite exciting to sort of play with. And in terms of covering it, what we have to do is do multiple passes, basically. And actually, it was quite time-consuming because we'd have a MoCo camera, which is this camera which does these endlessly repeatable passes, and then Dan would have to be a different character. So. We did 95 takes on that. First of all, they shot it with the cast, and then they shot it once with me as Harry, and, you know, we do maybe six, seven takes on that, and it was very specific stuff, so, like, if you were moved too far an inch to your left, right it was unusable because then you would, in theory, be standing on a version of me that we then filmed next, which is going to be put in later, if you sort of follow me. If you do follow that, then well done, you should join the visual effects department. We shot with Dan for like two days all on his own, but we'd have the actors he was playing alongside us. Here we go, rehearsing, just for Dan and... Come Dan would watch Fleur take off her top and sort of talk to Bill, and he'd study that very, very carefully. And then we'd talk together about how she would do that, and she would explain to Dan why she moved in a certain way, and Dan would listen, and then Dan would have a go. We had to act it out first, with them watching us to see how we move. Also in, in our own habits and how we'd say things. To make it real. It's really weird kind of watching someone pretend to be you. Normally I'm saying to Dan or Rupert or any of the actors I work with, where's the truth? What I realised was that we had to push it a little bit. To just exaggerate it by two or three percent, five percent, to sort of really enjoy it. It was more about the playfulness of it. And he loved the challenge of all of that. All right, all right. I watched him do, uh, do me, and uh, he got all, all, the, all the correct little traits. When I put a jumper on, I, I always um, I always put it up to my chest. It's a childhood trait, really. I put it up to my chest, put my chin in, and then I get the bottom and put it over my head. And he, he, he captured all that. It's great. It really feels like there are seven of one person. It is the film equivalent of actually doing a magic trick. 
Wow, wow. We're, we're identical. identical. And what's exciting about the visual effects stuff is that it's changing, you know, so often. And so this is going to just get more and more exciting over the next few years, hopefully. And now we're getting into the end of, of the Harry Potter series, which is the main battle at the end of 7B. The final battle is, is really the culmination of 10 years of work of all these films. It's really going to be our greatest triumph in terms of the work that we've achieved. It's so scary! It's going to be great. Ah! It's by far and away, you know, the biggest thing we've attempted. The actual scale of the battle, you know, is, is something spectacular and something that we've never seen before in a Potter film. Because really that's what we're trying to do. Give the audience a magical experience. That's one of the things that's great about the films is, is we get to make something which makes the audience feel like they are doing it. The Potter stories are filled with the fantasies you have as a child of being able to be invisible, being able to fly. That's something that I've always said about Harry Potter, is the sheer escapism of the whole story. You know, when you come home and, and it was just like this mundane day, and then you could just lose yourself in this world of dragons and spells and magic. The audiences want a heightened experience, I think. They want a rich, bigger experience than they could ever have. Our job is to deliver it with as much integrity as possible. That just comes from the talent of the people behind the scene. It's the artist, you know, behind all that. Whether he's doing it with a mouse or a cursor or whatever. They're the magicians, you know? The challenges are quite wide. Thankfully, we've all been working together on these films so long now that we've got the right team on board and we've got the right people to do it. I love the fact that on these movies I've actually managed to have a few moments myself where I've stood there and I've thought, you know Nick Dudman, you know, the little Nick Dudman? Um, see, over there, look, you know, we did it. You know, that's a bloody dragon and that's magic. I've often said that, that doing special effects has given me the ability to do for a career what I always wanted to do as a kid and got told off for. Being a, a special effects man on a Potter film is, is, is a dream. Special effects adds a huge amount to these films and allow them to be the spectacle that they, that they are. It's the belief that what you're seeing is magic. That's really exciting. To me, that's what Harry Potter is all about. Ah! Every great wizard in history started out as nothing more than what we are now, students. If they can do it, why not us?